Welcome to the Ecuador Earthquake Reconnaissance Briefing Webinar. I'm Shiza Fatima, EERI intern, and I'm glad that you've joined us today for this session. Before we start, I would like to briefly go over the GoToWebinar interface with you. This slide shows a screenshot of the attendee control panel. You can click on this orange button to open and close the control panel. By default, you entered the webinar with your computer's voice over IP for audio, but you can also dial in using your phone. To do that, simply select the telephone option in your audio pane and the dial-in information will be provided. For best quality, we recommend a hardwired internet connection for viewing the presentation and a telephone connection for the audio. You will also have the opportunity to ask questions to today's presenters. To do so, simply type in your question in this box right over here and click send. At the end of the session, if time permits, we will address your questions. With that, I would like to introduce Charles Hike, Chair of EERI's renowned Learning from Earthquakes program to start today's session. Uh, thank you, Shiza. Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Charles Hike. I'm Chair of the ERI Learning from Earthquakes Committee, and it's my pleasure today to present, uh, to basically open up this webinar on, the, on findings from the 2016 Ecuador, Ecuador earthquake. Um, so for those of you that aren't familiar with uh, the Learning from Earthquakes program, or ERI, we are a professional organization, global nonprofit, uh, with three, over 3,000 members, 13 regional, and 60 student chapters. Um, and for the last 50 years or so, we've been running around after earthquakes, uh, making observations about building damage, social disruption, lifelines, geotechnical observations, and so forth. Um, so that we can um, get the lessons learned uh, for mitigation purposes, um, publish spectra articles, give these webinars, uh, and very rapidly afterwards kind of give uh, the global community a handle on what's going on. So, and this is the part of that, the Ecuador earthquake. So a couple neat things about the Learning from Earthquakes program uh, within ERI that has happened, I guess, just in the past um, decade or so. One thing that we're doing is collecting uh, imagery out in the field, images out in the field, geotagging those and putting them online so that people can bring those up for the exact locations that they've been taken and cross-reference that with um, estimates of damage in the area, uh, ground motion and so forth, remote sensing imagery. And this gives a nice kind of holistic um, perspective of the type of damage that, that you're looking at, uh, where throughout the area, as well as presents a really great kind of uh, spatial catalog um, basically forevermore. Um, so in this event, there was over 4,000 field photos taken that were geotagged by the group here um, and others. And so that's a resource that's available uh, to you all. And you can get to there from the uh, Ecuador Earthquake Virtual Clearinghouse website. And this has not only the mapping data but it will have basically this uh, webinar available uh, reports uh, directly right after the event as well as uh, our published reports um, and any uh, other sorts of um, uh, really relevant stuff that's forwarded to the ERI team. We basically go through that uh, in real time and um, sort through it for you so that this becomes kind of a clearinghouse for you to go to find uh, relevant information for the event. So um, the digestion, if you will, of all of that digital photography and uh, geospatial information is really spearheaded by the ERI Young Members Committee. Um, Erica Fisher and Manny are very active in uh, getting this big team together. Alex as well does a lot of the GIS work so that this information can be disseminated to the, to the community. We really couldn't do that part of it without them, and uh, we're very thankful for for them and their contribution. Uh, and with that, I'm just going to hand it over to Forrest Lanning, who is going to give an overview of the earthquake. He was the, the lead there um, from Miyamoto, and they, uh, he's going to he's put together this nice presentation um, with this, this team of presenters. So over to you, Forrest. Hi. Thanks, thanks Charlie. My name is Forrest Lanning. Um, I was the team leader for the uh, Ecuador earthquake reconnaissance trip. And, um, <clears throat> and I'm just going to be giving a brief overview of the earthquake and um, our uh, mobilization. 
down there and, and then team members. Um, so quickly, the uh, earthquake what occurred obviously in Ecuador, which is in the uh, South American continent and sits on the uh, edge of the subduction zone between the Nazca and the South American tectonic plates. The topography of Ecuador varies greatly. It straddles the Andes. Elevations range from 6,200 meters down to sea level. There are large coastal lowlands and a small, uh, sh uh, shorter coastal mountain range interfacing with the sea. Brief um, some history on the seismic activity in Ecuador. Um, Ecuador has, has a history of large subduction zone related earthquakes. Uh, seven magnitude seven or greater earthquakes have occurred within 250 kilometers of the recent April 2016 events since 1900. On May 14, 1942, a 7.8 earthquake occurred 30, from sorry, 43 kilometers south of the April 16, 2016 event. On January 31st in 1906, a magnitude 8.5 earthquake, reportedly large as 8.8 .8 in some sources, originated on the subduction zone, interfacing 90 kilometers to the northeast of the April 2016 event, and ruptured over a length of approximately 400 to 500 kilometers, resulting in a damaging tsunami that has caused, that um, caused in the regions of about 500 to 1,500 fatalities. The April 2016 earthquake is at the southern end of the approximate rupture zone of the 1906 earthquake event. A shallow magnitude 7.2 earthquake occurred um, 240 kilometers east of the April 2016 event on March 6, 1987, resulted in approximately 1,000 fatalities. Um, <clears throat> briefly, I'm just gonna, there's the type of construction in this area in the Mantabi province is mostly reinforced concrete frame with masonry infill. The masonry is most of the time a hollow clay brick masonry. It's, um, it has a number of channels through it and they lay the masonry horizontally so the, um, the, the cavities are standing left and right so they don't fill with grout. Um, most, of, most all partition walls are unreinforced hollow clay um, masonry. You'll see a lot more examples of that in this, um, this, the other sections of the presentation. So, um, a moment magnitude 7.8 earthquake struck offshore of the west coast of the coastal area of Mantabi province in Ecuador at approximately 6.58 p.m. local time. The earthquake occurred as a result of a shallow thrust faulting near the plate boundary between the Nazca and the South American plate. At the location of the earthquake, the Nazca plate subducted eastwards beneath the South American plate at a velocity of 61 millimeters per year. The location and mechanism of the earthquake are consistent with the split on the primary plate boundary interface, or mega thrust, between these two large major plates. Subduction along the Ecuador Trench to the west of Ecuador and the Peru-Chile Trench for the south has led to uplift of the Andes Mountains range and has produced some of the largest earthquakes in the world, including the largest earthquake on record, the 1960 magnitude 9.5 earthquake in southern Chile. There will be more information in the geo um, geotechnical section that follows this. So the team was under pressure to mobilize and get to um, get to uh, Ecuador. Um, our sources said that the, the government has ordered a lot of demolition, really remarkably quick. Within a few weeks, a lot of um, the heavily damaged buildings were already cleared out and vacant lots. So we had to mobilize and get down there, and we eventually got down there on May 9th um, to try to see, um, to observe as much of the damage before it was cleared out. The team is made up of primary structural engineers in both academia and, um, and in practice, which includes Hector Monzon, Anna Gabriela Harrell, Alberto Monzon, Adrian Tola, May Lou, Arturo Schultz, and myself, Forrest Landing. And, um, and you can see our affiliations on the slide. So when we got to um, Ecuador, we had, to, we had to figure out what we can see with this a relatively short amount of time. We were there only a week. And um, originally, we wanted to see Pertinales, which is the closest area to the uh, epicenter. But um, our sources said that most of the buildings, being that they were only one to two story high buildings, were pretty much cleared out and demolished. And there wasn't much to see left. Um, we, we, so we, we kind of had to weigh that option, because it was going to be about a four hour drive each way, and trying to do that as a day trip from um, Manta, which we were, we were based at. 
So we ended up um, scrapping that, and we ended up visiting, concentrating our efforts on Manta, Puerto Viejo, Casita, um, Colone, Bahia, and um, and Clona. And um, we have we are we were presenting sections on Manta, Puerto Viejo, on specifically on those those two cities, and then we have um, some sections that, like the hospitals, will cover other cities. And I would like to uh, thank the following organizations and individuals for the assistance to the to the team, um, including uh, collaboration and financial support. And uh, and to the following individuals. And with that, I'd like to hand it over to uh, Sissy, who will be talking about the geotechnical observations, as um, she was part of the Gear ATC team. Yes, thank you very much, um, Forrest. Um, I'll be talking about uh, briefly about ge the main geotechnical observations uh, from the geotechnical extreme events reconnaissance um, team that was um, joined with the Applied Technology Council (ATC). Um, the, our team. Um, uh, got together and was on the ground uh, within 10 days from the earthquake on April 26th and stayed more than a week. Um, the team was co-led by Dr. Javier Vera from the University of Guayaquil and myself from WSP Parsons Bringenhoff and we were joined by structural engineer uh, Ramon Gilsons of GMS who was the leader from the ATC side. Uh, we had a combination of uh, wonderful um, uh, practitioners and academicians that uh, joined us um, and they are Daniel Alzamora from the Federal Highway Administration, um, Veronica Diaz uh, from Virginia Diaz from uh, GMS uh, funded by ATC, uh, Guillermo Diaz Fanas from WSPPB, uh, Gabriela Livers from the Army Corps of Engineers, Kyle Rollins from Brigham Young University, Clint Wood from the University of Arkansas, Ada Athanasopoulos-Zekos from the University of Michigan, and we were joined on site by uh, Roberto Luque of UC Berkeley, Professor Miranda, who was already there with um, the Peer Stanford team, and Enrique Morales, um, PhD student at the University of Buffalo, but also highly ranked official of the Ecuadorian Army. Um, and to recognize um, the Ecuadorian government, particularly the Ministry of Housing that provided us with a lot of access and information, the Army, the Dynamics Institute, and a lot of collaborators that you see here um, and are um, available in our report. Uh, just to um, the takeaways from a geotechnical perspective, uh, we believe that this is an earthquake that is going to be known for the side effects and strong soil amplification phenomena um, and liquefaction observations. The ground motions were extreme, often exceeding by far design standards, and most of the soil conditions in the affected areas were what we would call in the United States class F sites, either deep soft plastic clays or liquefiable man-made fields. Um, these are mostly on the shorelines. Um, side effects were evident with extensive liquefaction, landslide and slope stability issues that um, you're going to see in um, a few exhibits. Just keep in mind um, the uh, map of Ecuador and uh, what was affected was the western part of the country in the shoreline and um, the yellow pins that you see here is the gear ATC team uh, focus areas. Uh, we followed the damage patterns well you see the epicenter up in the north uh, with a red star most of the damage due to wave propagation happened southwards. Um, the um, reconnaissance means that we used and we were extremely lucky to have um, Enrique Morales with us and the, uh, the Army helping us uh, to provide large um, helicopters. Uh, we had boats where that we could uh, go and observe wharfs, uh, but also um, uh, we used door, uh, drones and 3D imaging techniques 
and we brought technology from the United States and measured with um, GeoStudio's uh, show velocity um, in the areas that were affected, as well as conventional uh, reconnaissance uh, methods as per year protocol. Um, uh, as Forrest said, uh, the tectonics of Ecuador are unique. It's probably one of the few, if, if not the only place on Earth that has all three types of plate boundaries that allow us to observe huge mountains, volcanic uh, features, and of course um, the Galapagos Island as a result of the subduction and hot spot volcanism. Um, and um, uh, you see here a complex, um, the complex system of movements of these different features provided by Professor Tulkeridis from uh, the um, Military Academy of Quito. What, uh, what we know from historic events is that um, uh, we know that megathrust subs subduction is the main earthquake um, uh, phenomena that we know since um, records from the uh, mid-1500s from uh, the Spanish were maintained. We know that we have at least 37 earthquakes of magnitude 7 or higher. The uh, slide that you see here shows the main events in the past 100 years and our earthquake of 2016 is shown in red. Uh, what is interesting is that um, the uh, area ruptured in the 1906 earthquake having a length of about 500 kilometers uh, was followed by this um, subsequent events in 42, 58, 79 uh, where we thought that um, uh, the sequence of rupture uh, was um, normal but uh, with a paper of Chian in 2014 and new models um, the asperity between 1942 and 58 ruptures um, uh, was found that it was remained unbroken since 1906. So the area where the um, April earthquake happened, which you see here with the star, was a, a kind of a seismic gap that was filled with this, um, this earthquake, which had magnitude of 7.8, uh, hypocentral distance of about 29 kilometers, and it was a big subduction event. Uh, here you see um, uh, records that were uh, kindly provided to us by the um, Geophysics Institute with red spots. You see from um, Roberto Luque the most uh, hit areas in terms of ground motions and as you move further away the PGAs drop. And what I would like to show you is a com compilation of the different records that are available. These are all in the east-west direction and there is one record um, in Pedernales that reached a 1.4 G PGA um, that we are studying. This is the record. Uh, you see it on the upper left corner and on the right hand side you see the response spectra and the geomean response spectra exceeding by far the current code that uh, was uh, it became in effect in a um, uh, year before that. Now all of these are very much a result of uh, very difficult soil conditions. This is a profile of downtown Guayaquil um, prepared by GeoStudios and Dr. Vera uh, that shows the green um, layers that you see out of about uh, in a profile that starts at about 150 meters deep is soft clays generally of high plasticity and high water contact similar to what you would see in Mexico City or e even in areas here in New York City in Queens. So um, in an epicentral distance of uh, 290 kilometers uh, you will, will see now a, a cross-section of uh, measured shear wave velocities uh, about uh, 300 kilometers from the epicenter. Uh, the red line is the soil profile of shear wave velocities. You see very low velocities to a depth of 40-50 meters. On the left with a fundamental period of on the order of 1.5 seconds. Going to the right there is the station's record
to uh, bridge embankments. These are um, the major failures are in the Rio Kiko Bridge and the Mejia Bridge, both built with well graded material and uh, two to one, two horizontal to one slope. Um, the top is a Rio Kiko bridge with 30 to 60 centimeters relative to the bridge settlement and on the right hand side you can see very large opening in the horizontal direction. In the Mejia bridge, a uh, typical um, tow and, um, uh, and um, slope failure uh, with uh, overall global stability um, issues and the clear patterns of circular failure planes that uh, were observed and currently being studied. In the dams, um, having an expert on risk assessment of dams from the Army Corps of Engineers, GG Levers, um, we um, we realized that um, we visited a lot through the helicopter or on site. There was not a lot of significant damage, small settlements and minimal outward displacements due to the seismic events. Uh, what would be important to note here is that there was no procedures to assess the dams as uh, the current conditions or as a result of, of the earthquake. Um, going into a very um, often uh, observations of landslides and, and rock falls, uh, which was very useful to uh, watch uh, using a lot of drone images. Um, it's uh, that there was no slope reinforcement and basically everything is built on um, just by ground without any reinforcement and often there is some protection wall to safeguard um, the slopes. And I will show at the end a movie that we created with a lot of drone images that shows one of the landslides, um, which is a major effect of this earthquake. Liquefaction was widespread in basically throughout the area that we observed in the shoreline. Um, and what you see here is the port of Manta and the yellow parts are the ones that that uh, suffered extensive liquefaction and uh, the sun poles were there even 10 days after we visited the site. There were a lot of vertical lateral movements and cracks that affected overall the port as you will see in the next slide that shows uh, displacements, cracks, settlements and what um, was important there uh, was that we used, when you see the upper left corner, um, areas um, based on damage that we uh, pinpoint and took uh, measurements of displacements vertically and horizontally and this will be in the gear report available online but also shear wave velocity measurements through MASW. There were significant damages to um, the piles of the wharves and um, these were mostly structural due to um, not a good enough connection of the piles to the uh, pile gaps. This is a zoom of the damage of piles and how um, we used these points to measure um, shear wave velocity with the MASW method. And, um, uh, this um, is the analysis that was done uh, by uh, Roberto Luque of UC Berkeley using shear wave velocity measurements that were measured and some assumptions using the Boulanger and Idris method and proving the low safety factor uh, for the uh, Manta port. Now what I would like to close with is how we use technology and uh, thousands of drone images to um, understand a large um, uh, failure. You see in a movie an overlay that um, was done by the 3D group of WSP on the initial conditions using drone and 3D images and when we took all these pictures together and put them together um, you can see a, a model of the 3D images. So the gray lines that you see here are actual failure zones that are in a true 3D mode that is can be used automatically to produce um, sections uh, without needing to do measurements. Um, and um, what is very interesting is that the, this condition after the earthquake, we were able to overlay it with a 3D Google map of uh, what happened right before and after. So um, 
basically it's the, um, the light shaded area is the before and the darker is the failed uh, zone, the before and after. I think now it's moving and you can see it. Um, the images will be also available online so you can see it as our time is very limited. And um, the technology and data processing involves, of course, drones, 3D CAD software, and we are currently using that to calculate volumetric changes for moving uh, soil and reusing it in areas uh, that are currently being rebuilt, as well as understanding these failures. Um, so with that, um, I think I'm, um, I wrapped up the... observed in the ground zero zone of Porto Viejo by Ana Gabriela Haro. Thank you very much. Hello everyone. This is uh, Ana Gabriela Haro from Ecuador. I am a PhD candidate at NC State University and I was part of the ERI reconnaissance team that traveled to Ecuador some days after the earthquake. During my presentation I will talk about, about um, the damage observed in the ground zero zone of Puerto Viejo. This is the outline of my presentation, which includes the introduction, the description of the damage captured on reinforced concrete buildings, and the conclusions. So let's start with the introduction. Uh, Puerto Viejo is one of the oldest and big cities in Ecuador, with a population of about uh, 250,000 people. It is the capital of the province of Manabí, and it is located 19 miles from the Pacific coast and 105 miles from the epicenter of the earthquake on April 16, 2016. During our visit, we observed that most of the damage was concentrated in the historical and commercial area of the city, and um, that is the reason why this area was declared as a ground zero zone controlled by the Ecuadorian Army Forces. Here we have uh, some damage statistics of the central area of Puerto Viejo where the ground zero zone was located. And uh, from about 7,080 buildings, uh, more than 560 were destroyed and more than 2,300 were affected by the earthquake. According to a report presented by the Ecuadorian Geophysics Institute, the maximum peak ground acceleration recorded in a station located in Puerto Viejo was 3.73 meters per second square, close to 0.4 g for the north-south component. And according to the same source, the intensity assigned to this area was 8, considering the European macroseismic scale. Now, let's see the damage captured on reinforced concrete buildings, uh, including residential and commercial buildings and churches too. As uh, Forrest mentioned before, Reinforced uh, concrete frame buildings with and reinforced masonry infills is the most common type of construction in Ecuador. Uh, a fact that is reflected on this slide, which tells us that from almost 2,200 buildings evaluated in this area of Puerto Viejo, more than 60% of them are uh, or were reinforced frame buildings. But we noticed that this type of construction resulted extremely flexible to withstand the lateral displacements introduced uh, or induced by the earthquake because, uh, as you may notice in the next slide, uh, small cross-sections are used in columns and beams, even for buildings of about four to five stories. Regarding the removal of debris, we were surprised to observe that the debris of many low-rise collapsed buildings had already been cleared in this zone, especially because in other affected cities, the removal of debris remained a problem. Mm. Now, let's talk about some specific cases to illustrate a little bit more the consequences of this earthquake. Here, I am showing a nine-story building that we were able to inspect even from inside and there we noticed that this complex consisted mainly of two sections placed in an L-shape 
where the two inches wide seismic joints suffered severe damage because of the large differential movements experienced during the earthquake. We did not observe structural damage here, but uh, the damage to contents, tile systems, and um, infill walls was extensive, and that is the reason why this building was not operating during our inspection. Overall, we observed significant damage to non-structural elements in many low to high-rise buildings where the uh, reinforced infill walls presented sheer cracks in some cases and even collapse in other cases, affecting surrounding the structures. So um, we detected a problem with the way the infill walls are planned and constructed because the material used here resulted heavy and uh, brittle to receive significant lateral displacements. As you may expect, after this strong earthquake, we also captured several sorry, medium high, uh, medium rise buildings that practically collapsed, jeopardizing adjacent structures. Here uh, you have an example of a 10 story building whose five to seven stories completely collapsed, and as a consequence, the upper levels were leaning towards the west direction. Regarding local damage on this building, we noticed the use of short columns, reduced cross sections, and poor reinforcement detailing in the collapsed stories. Fortunately, the adjacent structures have been evacuated after the earthquake, and actually the entire ground zero zone was evacuated and secured by the Army Forces of Ecuador. In general, um, we observed that the lack of robustness and redundancy caused a lot of damage. For example, here, the upper levels of the two annexes of this nine-story building completely collapsed. And um, regarding non-structural damage, the main building presented sheer cracks and the collapse of uh, facade infill walls. The picture shown in this slide at, at the top um, shows the show the total collapse of a building possibly because of lack of redundancy and a first sub-story configuration pretty common all around the area. And uh, in the next slide, um, we have uh, another case where lack of robustness was a problem. During the earthquake on April 16th, this uh, six-story building suffered severe damage in the upper levels. And as you may imagine, during the 6.7 and 6.8 magnitude aftershocks on uh, May 18th, more damage was accumulated and only the first three levels survived. We also noticed that the pounding between adjacent structures was another source of damage where seismic joints were completely omitted. And um, to make the things worse, we observed that the slabs of uh, adjacent buildings were at different heights and had different rigidities. And, um, in addition, we, we observed that uh, in some cases the differential movements were restricted because uh, parapet walls were crossing the joints. Overall, um, we observed poor reinforcement detailing in weak columns, beam column connections, and beams. Here, for example, the stirrups were made with smooth bars and were closed with 90 degree hooks. So it's possible that the year of construction of this building was more than 30 years ago when seismic design guidelines were not enforced by law. The fourth picture of this slide shows uh, beams connected to front columns of the buildings, but only in uh, one direction. And similar cases were found all around the area, but uh, in general, this type of uh, configuration did not fare well since the beams and joint connections were poorly designed to withstand lateral displacement. We were also able to capture plastic hinges developed at the base of some columns. 
And uh, here we have an example of a five-story building whose columns also show poor quality of concrete and corroded steel of space about twice the required spacing for a seismic region. And um, this tells us that a lack of control during construction stages would be another source of the, the damage captured in this area. We also found alterations on original configurations. You can see here only a few cases where steel structures have been added um, later on the top of the buildings, but uh, this was uh, detected everywhere all around the area. And uh, as you may know, the main risk here would be the increment in seismic loads that uh, were not considered during the design of the structures. Finally, let's uh, take a look at the damage capture in the Cathedral Jesus del Buen Pastor as an example of what happened to some churches there. Here we observed minor damage to infield walls and additionally damage to the interface between the main towers and the edges and parapets. Then uh, the stresses transmitted from the towers to the parapets exceeded the plane, uh, the in-plane deformation capacity of the parapets. So overall, the churches perform better than the, most of the other reinforced concrete buildings in this region. And uh, uh, to finish this presentation, here we have the conclusions. So the damage observed in this zone revealed the importance of enforcing design and construction codes in Ecuador to improve the seismic performance of new and existing buildings. And um, regarding the main causes of damage, in general, we observed uh, extremely flexible reinforced concrete frame buildings heavy and brittle infill walls that were not connected well to the main structure, lack of robustness and redundancy, poor quality of materials and poor detailing, which could be associated with lack of control during the construction stages. And um, with this, I will pass on to May, who will present the damage observed in Manta City. Thank you. Thank you, Gabby. Um, Hi, my name is May Quinn Liu. I'm from Farrell, I'm a software engineer in San Francisco. Um, thank you everyone for joining us this afternoon. And uh, I would like to talk about uh, what we observed in um, Manta, uh, specifically in the Taki area of Manta, which is considered the zone zero. Oops. Um, I would um, give you an outline of my presentation. So I will start out with, a, uh, with an introduction, and then I will talk about the observed damage and conclusion. Uh, you would very quickly notice that uh, my presentation is uh, very similar to uh, the one that Gabby just gave uh, about Puerto Viejo. So you can um, compa compare and contrast the two cities. So um, first of all, some background information about Manta is about 20 miles from Puerto Viejo uh, with a population of 221,000, uh, which is the fifth most populous uh, city in Ecuador. And uh, the area of Taki is uh, as shown in the map. A um, little bit more background about Manta uh, to give you a sense of the, in the structure that you will see. So Manta is uh, the world capital of tuna. And you also know that uh, from an earlier uh, presentation by CC that um, it has a major port for Ecuador. What you may not know yet is that it's also a domestic travel destination. So uh, this may look familiar to you, but here I would like to uh, highlight and contrast how Manta compared to the other areas. So uh, with Puerto Viejo, we had a PGA of about 0.4 G, and in Manta is uh, quite a bit higher. It's uh, over, five, over 0.5 G. It's about 30% more than uh, what we saw in Puerto Viejo. And here uh, is a map of Manta showing um, the damage concentration. So you can see uh, this is Taki uh, and the, kind of like the downtown area. You can see a lot of the destruction was concentrated there. So out of about 83,000 buildings, uh, 700 and, so 716 buildings were destroyed and over 5,600 buildings were damaged. 
Uh, next, uh, here, uh, we didn't touch on it earlier. So this um, April 16th earthquake had a death toll of 661 people, and about one third of it happened here in Manta, about 211 people. And uh, overall, in the earthquake, um, two, 2,000, sorry, 6,300 people were injured, and uh, there were about 28,000 people were made homeless. Um, a little bit comparison with uh, Puerto Viejo. Uh, generally, the building we see in Manta was shorter than Puerto Viejo, uh, but the construction type is quite typical. Uh, it's four to five story reinforced concrete frame building with masonry infill walls, uh, unreinforced and not anchored. And uh, we saw a lot of uh, residential buildings or hotels, and almost all of them have retail on the ground level. And a typical building would have the floors uh, extend over the sidewalk, sometimes with columns, sometimes without columns. Um, here, there are two uh, panoramas showing you the uh, street intersections uh, of Taki. Uh, you don't see people just walking around because the um, the access is restricted and is controlled by the military. Uh, one thing to note and contrast was that at least here we didn't see the military personnel with um, weapons, <laughs> so we saw that in uh, Puerto Viejo. And here, I would like to show you uh, some before and after photos. On the left-hand side, uh, you can see the before earthquake photos that I got from uh, the Google Street View. And then on the right-hand side, you see a photo that we took uh, while we were uh, at, the, at the site. Um, this one is a four-story reinforced concrete frame building with masonry infill walls. And you can see um, this is a photo taken on kind of like the front entry area. You can see that uh, concrete crushing at the base of the column. And uh, you can probably just infer from the photo that the concrete quality is quite poor. We suspect that it might have something to do with the sand, because um, right here we're very close to the ocean, so maybe the sand was just from the beach, and it's not very good for concrete quality. And then, as Gabby mentioned earlier, uh, we noticed 90-degree hoax instead of 130-degree hoax for the, size, uh, for the ties. And then sometimes, uh, even the 90-degree hoax, they were too short. Um, and then here you can see, you know, insufficient concrete confinement at the column as well. Up next, uh, you can see an interior shot. Here, I want to show you that uh, on the right-hand side, you can, it, it's the same column for two photos, but uh, on the right-hand side, you can see that the column was confined by two uh, non-structural walls, partial height, but there's no seismic separation between the walls and the columns. And on the left-hand side, you can see that the column is quite lightly reinforced, and uh, there's in, insufficient concrete confinement. And for this particular instance, we also notice smooth rebars. But also, as Gabby mentioned, it's not that common, so we just suspected that maybe this building is somewhat older. So that's why they have a smooth bar as opposed to the deformed bar that we see more typical. Here, um, I'm actually still on the same block. Um, this is an adjacent um, hotel um, in the same area. You can see on the left-hand side uh, um, before photo and on the right-hand side with all the seismic cracks uh, for the after photo. And you can notice that uh, on the ground floor, the floor height is much longer. And also, uh, you see the discontinuous wall. And on the right-hand side, you can see the extensive wall damage. And the next slide is the same building. And I just turned the corner. And you can see the extensive um, cracks in the non-structural, uh, but uh, nonetheless, taking shear force uh, unreinforced masonry walls, and after they fell in plane, they fell off plane and, you know, in some instances, uh, have the debris on the sidewalk. Uh, next up uh, is a five-story concrete uh, frame building, um, and uh, on the right-hand side, you can see that, that on the ground floor, uh, the column is very they're very tall. And then one thing I want you to uh, see is that the typical column uh, on the floor above is uh, rectangular, but then they become round on the ground floor. And here you can see some uh, displaced uh, shape of the concrete columns. And you can note that uh, this column uh, has a rectangular rebar cage, even though it was poured as a round column. And uh, the quality is similar to what we saw before, which is 
which isn't that great. And then the unreinforced masonry wall uh, was not braced for our plane loading. Uh, here, uh, it appears to be a residential building. And uh, you can see that there's no columns uh, overhanging, support, supporting the overhang uh, of the typical floor. And then the ground floor seems to be much higher. So it looks like it was a soft story uh, candidate. And on the right hand side, you can see that the ground floor completely collapsed. And here, um, the left hand side shows a blown up photo of uh, this uh, circle here. It appears that um, the building drifted too much during the earthquake. and um, and a secondary effect of the gravity system took place and uh, that caused the collapse of the ground floor. Um, here, um, this is the municipal market in Turkey. And you may not see what is missing immediately, but uh, let me give you a hint. Something's missing right there. So let's take a closer look. So here, there was a four-story uh, reinforced concrete frame building with masonry infill wall that completely collapsed. And uh, in, that, uh, in that building, uh, 91 people uh, lost their lives. Uh, that was uh, 91 out of 211 in Manta. And this is uh, the next building, which, uh, as you can see, has a higher floor to floor height um, on one of the levels, and that uh, seems to have contributed to the story collapse during the earthquake. So um, to sum it up, um, what we saw was quite similar to what uh, Gabby uh, reported earlier uh, about Puerto Viejo, like uh, very flexible reinforced concrete frame beams with heavy unreinforced masonry infill walls without bracing for our plane loading and all that. Um, also, um, we also noticed inadequate concrete confinement for the columns. Uh, one thing uh, that the team noticed a little bit more specific to Manta was that we saw more soft story behavior in Manta, but then we're not quite sure if it was it was because there were more, or was it just because uh, the demolition was more um, what was quicker in Puerto Viejo, so we don't even see uh, what was col what collapsed. And in Manta, they haven't cleaned it up yet, so we were able to see that. So with that, I would like to uh, pass it to Adrian. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Adrian Tola. I'm a student here at Virginia Tech. I, I was born and raised in Ecuador, and um, traveling with the ERI team was definitely a transforming experience, particularly from the human side. Uh, I will be presenting to you what the team observed in terms of the performance of the hospitals. Since these facilities have to, conceptually, they have to remain operational um, after the airport. The ERI team had the opportunity to visit uh, five different hospitals in four cities, uh, Manta, Puerto Viejo, Bahia, and Chone. Um, all, from all those five buildings that we observed, um, only two of them were operational, and actually one of them was um, operating only at the first floor. Um, well, we visit this building. We are offering you uh, this table at the bottom of this slide, just so you have a point of comparison. We visit uh, this series roughly three weeks after the earthquake, um, and well, uh, if, if uh, in case of uh, you want to compare with uh, some of the observations, this table will be very helpful. Before going to um, the details of each of the hospitals, we would like to share with you um, some typical aspects of the construction system in Ecuador. Usually these kind of buildings, the hospitals, are usually made of concrete moment frames at all base, not just at the perimeter, like it's common practice in the US. Uh, we use a lot of uh, waffle slabs, um, and also, like um, <clears throat> um, May and uh, Gabby were telling you, telling to us before, we use a lot of um, infill with uh, unreinforced masonry walls. Um, um, mm -hmm. Another feature uh, very common for these hospitals is that they are built in segments. As you can tell from this picture for the hospital of Chone, you can see separate buildings with different heights and uh, you sometimes with different age of construction. Uh, any structural system. 
Uh, we can tell you right now that one of the problems that this can cause is, of course, um, um, panding of one segment towards each other. And we'll see this. We'll just see in uh, just a few slides. With that, I would like to start talking to you about the first hospital that we visit. This is um, the hospital of Manta. As you can tell, um, there was significant damage, and the picture is actually from a few days right after the earthquake. It was not uh, a picture taken by your team, um, but I just wanted to show you this slide so you can see uh, the debris um, from the from the exterior walls, particularly. Um, you can see that these buildings, and you will see in the few slides also, usually are uh, consists of a big block, one story high, and also a central block, multi story high. This is a picture that um, <clears throat> we got from our team on the, when visiting this hospital. As you can see, there was significant damage to non-structural components like partition walls and also um, mechanical equipment. We're showing to you at the upper right, um, <clears throat> upper right part of the slide um, the spectrum uh, recorded by uh, <clears throat> closer to Manton. You can see accelerations up to 1.5 G. And um, as you can tell, but, well, this, this building suffered um, a lot of damage. We'll see in the next slide what we observed in the last floor of this building. Since it was the last floor, we we're probably um, expecting <clears throat> less drift and less damage, but that was not the case. We observed significant damage in the non-structural components for every single floor of this building. You can see in the picture amount of debris. Actually, the picture is showing one of the corridors. So you can imagine how um, difficult it was for the people to evacuate. This is also on the third floor. And we're showing to you, what we want to show it to you is um, <clears throat> you can see on the bottom there is a partition wall made of unreinforced masonry that is on the ground. You can also see mechanical equipment just hanging from the ceiling. And um, this was a typical pattern for every single floor in every single room. The second hospital I want to share with you is the one in Puerto Viejo. This is the, um, the, no the name of this hospital is the HIES, which stands for the um, Ecuadorian Institute of Public Health. The accelerations, as we can show in the spectrum, they were up to, to 2G. Um, you know, like if you just look at the PGA, 0.38G, um, that was probably, that probably can tell us, um, that probably can tell us a lot, uh, but it, it's, it's uh, just by looking at the spectrum, you can see like getting acceleration of 2G was, um, you can expect significant damage. This is actually one of the buildings where we did not, um, the building that we, we did not see damage and it was operating. You can see in this couple of pictures uh, taken by um, um, by your team that um, it was operating. And um, you know, uh, Gabby mentioned um, some pictures that we take at the ceramic tiles in one of the buildings in Puerto Viejo. And uh, you know, ceramic tiles can be a good indicator about the behavior of those buildings. And I'm pointing it out on the right side of the slide, one of the stairs where it was seeing no damage on the on the on the walls. Um, this building was um, the big the big area consisted of a one story build one story high building and also the central block was a three story building and uh, the only cracks that we saw were on the um, on the seismic joint. Also in Puerto Viejo, uh, we visited this uh, hospital of Solca. This is an oncology hospital for patients um, with cancer. As you can tell from the picture, there was um, significant damage in the facade. Uh, you can see uh, the, some of the glasses are broken. Some of the unreinforced masonry uh, is also falling down. And um, when we look, when we get inside of this building, we actually uh, have access to this um, um, to the second level of the building. And um, wanted to show you and emphasize the picture on the left. You can see uh, some debris, of course. But just please take some attention to the construction process of uh, this partition wall. It's common practice in Ecuador, unfortunately that um, you, you start building up your wall until the point where, only until the point where the ceiling can cover it. So that, uh, um, that just left without support 
to these uh, walls, and then that's that's what happens when you have lateral accelerations um, induced to these walls. On the right side, we wanted to show you some structural damage that we have at Q. Um, we are showing you one of the columns between the second and third level, where um, you can see uh, no ties um, at this um, right next to the joint between being columns, and um, well, that possibly uh, that's something that. Uh, um, has to be studied in detail because we were not able to see all of the columns, so there might be more structural damage in this building. Uh, so interesting, um, when we were walking towards the upper floor of this building, um, if I can just go back for a couple of seconds, you can see this building, uh, of course, so we're looking at the multi-story high, um, multi-story building. You're looking on the right side, I'm sorry, um, oh, the upper floors did not have major damage, which um, uh, you might expect that from a moment frame behavior, less, less drift at the upper stories, but um, it was interesting to see that the damage was not, if you compare this with Manta, I mean, that's, uh, that's uh, Manta was destroyed pretty much, the hospital in Manta. Uh, this is the first story uh, block of a uh, solid building that you can see operating. Um, the next, the next uh, hospital is the one that we visited in Bahia de Caracas. Um, it's one of my favorite buildings to talk about it. Uh, this building is a, used to be a concrete moment frame, but it was retrofitted in the year 2000, um, and it was cast uh, with um, six new shear walls. And the retrofitting was actually because uh, um, different earthquake that happened in 1998. Um, this building performed uh, decent. There we evidence um, a lot of uh, structural damage, a lot of non-structural damage. But um, we're pointing it out in this uh, in this slide, deficiency of the retrofitting techniques. You know, on the left side uh, shows uh, the boundary yell, the column that you can call it as the boundary element of the shear wall. And um, when going going uh, closer, you see the picture on the right side. And you can see that it was uh, there was jacketing of the concrete columns using steel angles, um, and it performed it performed uh, pretty good. When going to the inside, you can see one of the worst examples of attaching a wall. Oh yeah, there was also actually no attachment. You can see our team is looking at a wall um, that um, used to uh, used to serve for uh, separating areas, but there was no attachment. To either to the ground or to the upper floor or to um, anything. The only attachments were just to the transfer walls, which make this wall to fail um, out of plane. Something interesting: we saw a lot of cracking in the first floor, but all but most of the walls were still standing. Uh, so that's an indicator also of a good performance, probably because less drift uh, caused by. Um, by these shear walls, by having these shear walls, there would probably, uh, probably, of course, there would be like less drift, and that would, as a result, there was no, no many walls that actually were down into the ground. Uh, the last building is uh, of silver. Um, just want to take a look. The, the last building was the Napoleon Davila in Chone, a uh, very interesting hospital built in segments, and. Um, uh, you know, like you can see in the picture, block one and three. Well, they pound very badly into block number two, and um, you can see the interior of block number two where we saw a lot of damage. Uh, block number two, as you can see in the square, there was a, a permanent deformation also, um, probably caused due to um, settlement also on the on the ground and due to the pounding of these blocks. The upper floors, no damage. Um, as important conclusions were. There is definitely poor performance of unreinforced masonry walls. Um, we did not see damage in the structural system itself, meaning beams and columns, but that has to be explored in detail. We saw a lot of uh, we, we saw this retrofitting technique with shear walls that uh, in the hospital of uh, Bahia that work. That's important, and um, the damage caused in Chone due to the seismic joints could probably have been avoided. Uh, there were no casualties, uh, almost very just few casualties uh, in this hospital, so that's something good. Something, some thoughts to think in mind is um, what level of damage implies demolition of these hospitals. 
um, how much would it cost to instrument these buildings and um, uh, think about the awareness of uh, that the structural engineers that were, were probably aware of a lot of these uh, inconsistencies in the construction. Other teams that explore similar buildings are the team from uh, Stanford University, led by Eduardo Miranda, and also the team uh, with um, Enrique Morales from University of Buffalo. Thank you. With all of this, I will pass to Hector. Uh, good afternoon. My name is uh, Hector Monson. Uh, <laughs> I will talk again about the partitions and the cladding in the multi-story buildings. You have already heard uh, enough about, about this topic, but uh, let me kind of wrap it up. The partitions and, and cladding, as you have already seen in the, in the, in the, in the previous presentations, uh, were made almost universally of uh, unreinforced masonry, and the seismic performance was not at all satisfactory. Uh, the main reasons, uh, the partition itself is too stiff as compared to the frames. They are inadequately fixed to the structure and uh, they are practically not reinforced or we can say they were unreinforced masonry. Gibson board is uh, very seldom used in Ecuador and uh, also for the facades, uh, more flexible panel uh, systems uh, are, not, are not used. So. About the multi-story buildings uh, that you have already heard, uh, uh, they are usually in this area about uh, 10 story height. Uh, the older units are flat slab on, or waffle slabs on columns, and the newer units are girded columns, uh, frames with reinforced concrete floors. Uh, one important uh, aspect is that shear walls are not used at all. The building occupancy in this area are apartments. Uh, they are condominiums in which, which are used during vacation periods, and most of the year they are uh, practically empty. Uh, there are also hotels, hospitals, uh, the government buildings, and uh, very few uh, office office buildings. The materials are mainly of two types, the hand compact baked clay bricks and the blocks of standard size which are either concrete or one kind of cement mortar uh, mix, mix. Sometimes uh, extruded hollow clay units uh, are, are used. In, in, the, in the larger cities, this uh, type of uh, hollow units are more frequently used, but in this area, uh, the, the two systems that you see in the pictures uh, are, the, uh, are, are the common usage. Uh, regarding the cladding, uh, you have here two, two examples. Uh, definitely the inadequate anchorage to the main structure is a factor and uh, the, the, the cladding simply topples and falls to the, and falls to the ground. If it is a little bit uh, better attached, uh, so it uh, virtually disintegrates because of the lack of reinforcement of the, of the masonry. And uh, of course, uh, this is uh, this is a serious threat, uh, both for for uh, people on the ground, or as in this case, as you see that the hospital wall collapsed on the ambulance uh, garage. In the interior partitions, which you already have seen enough examples. But uh, let me tell you that, that here I, I tried to select buildings that had almost no structural damage. So that means 
that the, the damage you are looking at uh, in, in many of these pictures are damage that is simply produced by the, by the type of partition uh, that, that, that is used in the area. Uh, one of the main issues here is is, uh, is uh, blocked means of, of egress, and the fact that in many of the, of the government buildings and other buildings that that are not or were not used at the time of the earthquake, it was uh, that that was fortunate. But lo look at the left, the, the there is a completely collapsed. Uh, uh, duct or case for, for the stairs and uh, it's uh, totally blocked. Uh, the, the same goes for the other pictures and um, let's uh, talk a little bit about the root of this performance uh, problems. Uh, as uh, it has been already evident with all the previous presentations, masonry partitions and the cladding are brittle, unreinforced, and too stiff for the typical building structure. This type of masonry starts to crack within a few millimeters of in-plane story displacement, while the, while the typical building frame uh, is so flexible that it starts to yield uh, at about two centimeters of interstory displacement. So, um, if the masonry is uh, as unreinforced as we have seen it, uh, over here, it uh, simply disintegrates at the design earthquake load. Even if the partition is permitted to slide or not connected to the ceiling, to the top slab, as you saw in many of the of the pictures in the in the presentations, uh, they they still they they still topple and uh, 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 bang against the structure and the columns, and um, uh, also for the claddings, a more flexible system. Um, is, uh, is, is needed. But before going to try to, so to say, perfect or rescuing this uh, masonry system, uh, there, there is a fundamental issue to, to talk about. And um, for the usual architectural usages in Ecuador and in other Latin American countries, uh, the, the big conclusion is stiffer structures are needed uh, if, 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 if the general usage is trying to be maintained. So it is necessary to use uh, things uh, such as the shear walls to laterally stiffen the, 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 the buildings. In, in my professional practice in a Central American country, in Central American countries, it becomes evident that if you design only a girder column frame, it's, it's, it's too flexible. You have to use uh, shear walls, uh, both to, to, to stiffen the building and to strengthen it. So, um, before addressing the issue of uh, how can we design properly a, a, a masonry a masonry partition, uh, the 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 thing is that uh, stiffer structures are needed. That's that's the conclusion, and not only the partitions are are affected, also the especially the hanging ceilings are are very, very vulnerable uh, with, uh, with these kind of systems. But uh, let's do another question. Why this penchant in, uh, with the masonry in Latin America? Well, uh, one reason is simply custom and usage. This is the case in Ecuador. 
gypsum partitions are simply not used, at least not in the area, uh, in the coastal area that we visited. Uh, it has to be said that in several other Latin American countries, the use, the use of Gibson partitions is much more extensive. And this, of course, lowers the mass of the buildings and, uh, and also, uh, uh, hopefully, it, will, it permits for, for uh, um, better uh, seismic performance. And uh, also the use of panel uh, facades is, is increasing. But there are two factors that still make uh, masonry an, an issue in Latin America. Uh, one is that uh, people accept a Gibson board division or partition uh, within their property. But uh, if, if you have your neighbor on the same floor, there you want a solid barrier. Um, something that you can not cut the wall and feel that is it, it is really uh, really solid. And the other uh, factor is aesthetic, uh, especially for the facades, because uh, uh, in in many places architects simply love the brick facades. Here in Ecuador, they are not used as uh, exposed brick facades. For in many other countries. The exposed brick is uh, an, an aesthetic feature of the of the architecture of the of the building. So uh, thank you very much, and uh, here we can go to the next presenter, Arturo Schultz. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Hector. Uh, First of all, uh, I'm Arturo Schultz, professor of civil engineering at the University of Minnesota, and I have had the pleasure and the privilege of joining this EERI reconnaissance team. Uh, I was also partly sponsored by the Masonry Society. Uh, my task today is to make some brief comments about building uh, tagging and some of the things that we observed uh, during uh, the reconnaissance. So let me start with some salient observations, and these include things that we observed as well as the EFIT team, the Earthquake Engineering Field Investigation Team, uh, sponsored by the Institute of Structural Engineers in the UK. Uh, they didn't uh, join us, but they did send us uh, some of their observations in the form of uh, several documents. Um, let, let me first start out with some things that I didn't list here, but I think are worth mentioning. Uh, one of them has to do with the reaction time uh, of the uh, engineers that went out into the field to assess and evaluate the buildings immediately after the earthquake. They were able to organize and deploy within 48 hours of the event. Um, considering the very large area that was affected, that uh, was uh, certainly a considerable feat. I also want to note that they used a Spanish version of the ATC document ATC20 for the post-earthquake evaluation of buildings. Uh, there was a version that was being developed uh, by um, the Civil Engineering Department of the University of San Francisco in Quito. Uh, that document wasn't fully completed. Uh, nonetheless, they used uh, the Spanish version. Uh, they were assisted by the use of the phone, a smartphone app for, uh, for this document, and that turned out to be quite efficient. Um, among the things that were not as positive was that there appeared to have been uh, some different interpretations of the typical uh, red, yellow, green tagging system for buildings, uh, in particular among the various areas that were affected by the earthquake. Uh, in particular, the red tag was um, understood in some cases to signify demolition, in other cases simply not to enter because uh, there was deemed to be a life hazard in the damaged building. Um, there didn't appear to be, uh, in all cases, uh, a consensus between assessors and um, those responsible for demolition as to the meaning of these red tags. Uh, the entire country mobilized very quickly to clean up after the earthquake, uh, and with such rapid uh, uh, demolition um, in, immediately after the event, it was reported that some buildings that might have been repaired and retrofitted were demolished uh, possibly unnecessarily. 
I would also like to note that this was the first time that ATC20 was used in, in Ecuador. Uh, I'd like to next uh, just give you a brief impression of what we seem to have seen uh, regarding the issue of red tagging buildings and what that means uh, to some and not to others. Uh, this, uh, I would like to bring your attention to the beachside town of Kanoa. This is a uh, located about 190 kilometers south-southwest uh, of the epicenter along the, uh, the coast of Ecuador. Um, we were told that about 50 percent of the buildings were said to have been severely damaged or collapsed. By the time we arrived, um, most of the cleanup had been concluded, so we were unable to see many of these heavily damaged or collapsed buildings. Uh, however, in this panoramic view that you see at the bottom, um, in the center of Kanoa, you can see that there's hardly any buildings left. So it seems to have been, at least in some places, uh, the demolition was beyond even the 50% that we were told. And so the question is, how many of these buildings that were demolished could have been saved? Um, now, in general, we did notice that a lot of the tagging we saw uh, was appropriate, um, if not a bit conservative, uh, with the exception, of course, of what a red tag uh, building meant, um, which is that it is unsafe to inhabit or even enter to retrieve belongings, but not necessarily to demolish. Generally speaking, the yellow tag structures were moderately damaged, uh, such that uh, entry uh, should be restricted. And a green tag structure uh, we generally saw was uh, either undamaged or had uh, slight damage um, such that uh, occupancy, immediate occupancy, was lawful. I'd like to show you some examples of green, yellow, and red tag buildings. Um, the first one is an apartment building uh, called El Faro, which means the lighthouse. Um, Hector had just, has just shown you a picture from a distance of this building. It's located along the waterfront of the city of Bahia de Caracas, about 210 kilometers uh, from the epicenter. Uh, as Hector mentioned, it is a popular vacation destination for uh, the people of Ecuador. It's a very pretty city. And all along this waterfront, you see the very elegant buildings up to 10 stories high, many of them quite modern, um, from reinforced concrete frame buildings uh, with uh, some form of masonry infill. This one had uh, block infill. Uh, there was uh, no evident damage to the structural system, but there was damage to uh, the uh, to some of the masonry infill. However, it was slight cracking damage, something that could be easily repaired. The building was tagged as uh, habitable, uh, and in this picture, in the first in the entry of the building, you can see the the tag. If I close up uh, a little more on the tag. You will uh, notice that it says that it's been inspected and that it's uh, legally permitted to occupy this building. It's, it's not a green tag, but this serves the same purpose. I do note, however, that the form wasn't actually filled out. <laughs> it's a blank form. Uh, so that raises uh, certainly raises some questions. Uh, the next building is a case of a yellow tag building. It, it's a, a, a four-story, um, relatively sm small floor plan apartment building that was under construction. It's located in the Tarki district, which uh, was mentioned earlier in the presentation in the, in the city of Manta. Uh, the Tarki district has a mix of old and new. Uh, it's um, a very high density uh, area. Uh, and there was, a, as was mentioned before, a lot of damage. This is a four-story RC frame building with unreinforced concrete block infill. Uh, as you can see, it was under construction at the time. The windows haven't been, ha had not even been uh, installed. There was minor cracking to the infill um, and to the cladding, but the building was tagged as yellow. Uh, we did not enter the building, so we are unaware of what there may be present inside of the building. We do note, however, that there was an adjacent collapse on one side, and then um, the fact that the building was unfinished um, may make it a hazard, and so we concluded that that may have been the reason the yellow tagging was uh, uh, given to this building. A close-up of the first story, you can see some of the damage in the large door openings um, in, in this building. You can see um, the yellow tag. Uh, the next building 
is in once again in the town of Kanoa. This is a it was a hotel. Uh, this building uh, was w unlike most of the other buildings in Kanoa, had not been demolished yet, but it was scheduled for demolition the day after we saw it. So I guess mm -hmm. we got there just in the nick of time. Um, the building is a four-story reinforced concrete frame uh, structure. Um, you can see it here. It has a, a mix of both concrete block and solid clay brick infill. Um, it's not clear whether it was added at different times or if that was just the decision at the time of initial construction. The building um, has uh, was, as you might imagine, tagged red uh, because of the extent of damage. Uh, it has a, floor, a, a structural system which was essentially flat slabs of the lightened type of slab that Adrian mentioned earlier, in which concrete block are placed and left in, in place. Uh, we, we saw uh, evidence that there was uh, very large movements, relative movements between the slab and the columns, that the columns in fact had been discontinued through the four slabs and we believe there was very little reinforcement crossing through um, so, such that these connections acted as simple connections. Um, thus giving rise to very large drifts um, in this building. Uh, in addition to that, the slab in every floor, uh, as you can see here, uh, had a very large opening uh, to create a tall atrium in the building. Uh, in any event, the building underwent very large permanent drifts uh, such that it couldn't uh, be repaired and was scheduled for demolition. What I'd like to do next is look at two cases um, quickly uh, uh, of buildings that were uh, tagged uh, red that might have been unnecessarily tagged red. And uh, the first one is a bank in the town of uh, Puerto Viejo. It is the Banco Pichincha, which is one of the largest banking institutions in, um, in Ecuador. Uh, this is a photograph from Google before the earthquake. Um, and the next one is a photograph that we took after the earthquake. It's a four-story building. It appears to be on the order of uh, three or four decades old. Um, it has a very large atrium with staircases and walkways around two sides of the, of the room that are hang, overhanging as cantilevers. It also features on the outside, as we mentioned earlier, um, an overhanging balcony. Um, this is common uh, throughout the country. Um, also, uh, a, the cantilever structure, and there was cracking damage at the base of the cantilever there. Uh, it was supported temporarily with these bamboo struts, um, effectiveness of which can be questioned. Um, inside there was uh, extensive non-structural damage. You can see the wall coverings came down. Uh, you can see the exposed concrete block. Uh, however, the structural system seemed to be sound. There were these uh, three-story tall uh, RC frames. Um, uh, and there was no damage to those uh, components, and that is the uh, walkway and the staircases that were damaged during the earthquake. Uh, the damage, as you can see here, is essentially uh, cracking damage that could probably be repaired if the reinforcement details are adequate. Uh, yet the building was labeled, was tagged red, and uh, the bank actually moved, and uh, it's likely that this building uh, could be demolished. The next example is uh, a building in, uh, in the Tarki district of Manta. It is the Comercial Bigote building. It's an older building, uh, Art Deco style. Um, as you can see here, five stories tall. Uh, it has, uh, it's a corner building and it features balconies in the, uh, in the exposed corner. Um, and the building um, did see some damage during the earthquake. This photograph was taken uh, after the earthquake. Uh, there is damage to the RC, in, I mean the concrete block infills, but um, this balcony did suffer some damage and some of this debris did uh, collapse onto the street, so there was a falling hazard associated with the damage to this building. Um, the building featured a colonnade uh, for the uh, overhanging floor that has been discussed, but these columns were intact. Uh, there was some damage, but it <laughs> appears to have been from earlier uh, incidents involving uh, vehicles because uh, they, the, the damage was uh, painted and the paint was intact. Uh, the damage that was uh, uh, visible was cracking damage in the infill that you can see at the base of the window and then in the pier shown here. Nonetheless, this building was also tagged red and uh, it would probably be demolished even though there's no evidence that there was uh, damage to the structural uh, 
system and the non-structural damage is something that could probably be repaired. With this then I'd like to com uh, complete my presentation uh, with the following three conclusions. In general, tagging followed commonly accepted standards uh, except for the definition of what a red tag means. Uh, and it wasn't necessarily from the building evaluation side but it is uh, uh, the question of how uh, this red tagging was interpreted following the evaluation and the decisions that were made based on that red tagging. Uh, in some cases, this red tag was taken to automatically signify that demolition was needed, and that's not necessarily the intent of a red tag. Uh, the concern here is that in the zeal to clean up uh, the affected areas, repairable buildings may have been demolished when they could have been repaired and retrofitted. Uh, with this, I conclude my part of the presentation. Thank you, Art. Um, this is Forrest Lanning again. And because we ended um, a bit early, we have time for some questions. And I'm going to read, um, I'm going to start off with some of the questions that were sent through the, uh, the webinar interface. And I'd like to start off with most of the damaged buildings appear to be um, of older non-ductile non construction. How did the new ductile concrete frame building perform? And I'm going to um, ask. Oh, I'm going to ask Art to answer that. Well, my, my response is that we were across the street in the hotel. We were across the street from a large a commercial building that was under construction, reinforced concrete frame uh, with uh, reinforcement details that we could see that it met accepted standards and uh, larger column sections that you might expect. There was no damage that we could see to that building and con uh, construction was continuing. I do have to add that most of the partitions had not been installed in the building, so uh, it's not necessarily a good a good measure, but uh, it, it is an indication to me that a modern uh, uh, ductile reinforced concrete frame structure would have done much better than what we saw. Can I say something? Yeah, and then um, there's another question. Were um, any structures in the area designed with base isolation technology? and um, May, maybe you could um, comment on that. Uh, sure. So um, the area that's affected by the April 16 earthquake uh, were away from the major cities like uh, Quito and Guayaquil. So uh, as far as we know, there were no buildings on isolators, but there was a new design bridge. Uh, I believe it opened about five years ago. Uh, that was near Bahia. And uh, it performed really well. And uh, as a matter of fact, we drove on it too. And I believe it wasn't even closed after the earthquake. So uh, yes, uh, new design uh, base isolated uh, structures performed very well. Great, thank you. Another question was, uh, sorry, it's growing past me. Um, any comments about? green tag buildings and the people's perception on this. Would they have considered that their buildings are perfectly fine to live there without enhancing them, even though there was probably as bad as the others? Um, Art, you can comment on that one. Well, unfortunately, I didn't, I didn't speak with too many of the people, <laughs> so it's hard for me to have to, to be able to, to speak on what they thought. However, there were uh, buildings that were green tagged that were being occupied, so my suspicion is that uh, if they had concerns, they, they still went ahead and occupied them. Uh, maybe Gabby or, or uh, Adrian can, can fill in, or Hector. Uh, can you repeat that, Art? I, I didn't get it. Um, the green tag buildings that we saw in parts of the city that were open were, were being occupied, so it seems to me that people accepted the green tag. Um, since I didn't speak to people about that particular issue, I can't really say what they might be thinking about that. Well, they, they, they did accept the, the, the green tag in, in, the, in the cases that, uh, that I saw or I talked to, to, to people, and they were conscious that uh, there might be some, uh, some uh, damage or cracking uh, the only concern are always the aftershocks. So there is people that uh, say that uh, said they will occupy their building again after the aftershocks. 
Yeah, and that be, besides what Hector say, um, you know, like the the fact of having your house with a green tag is a matter of um, commodity because uh, uh, the other option is just go to uh, regular places where, uh, well, pretty much with no house. So whoever has a a house who has a green tag, um, first of all, they will be gladly accepted that. And they will, even if it's red, they will probably try to even sleep in that house. Um, so that, that's probably what I can say about it. We have kind of, there's a kind of a follow. Oh, sorry. No, I saw an interesting case in in, in Bahia, in which uh, there was an undamaged building, but uh, with with heavy partition damage. So the tax said no. Uh, no structural damage, but uh, then it said uh, the building uh, has to be completely reanalyzed uh, again because of the because of the cracking of the mason. So it's uh, as Art said, some of these tags are conservative because for new buildings you are not asking for for the analysis of of, of the partition, but in in this case, since you see the damage, so the the one the person that is tagging uh, acts uh, acts uh, really well, somewhat uh, in the conservative side. But that uh, for me is understandable. Thank you. Um, we're gonna we're gonna move on to one, another question. Um, why does Chile use concrete shear walls? Extensively in Ecuador, not use shear uh, concrete shear walls at all. Um, I thought maybe, uh, probably either Hector or Gabby or Adrian might be able to comment on that. Well, I, I this is Hector. I could not tell why they are not uh, used. I, I didn't. I didn't see any in the area. But uh, maybe, uh, maybe Adrian or or Gabby can comment. Uh, about that since they are from Ecuador. Okay, maybe I can answer that question a little bit more, um, with more details. Um, actually, uh, shear walls or structural walls are being used in modern uh, reinforced uh, concrete buildings. And um, what uh, was reported is that uh, even those buildings that included this kind of, uh, of uh, systems suffered non-structural damage. So, um, what the, the maybe uh, the, the problem was maybe related to the they are only being used in the in in the specific areas, for example, where the elevators are located or where the stairs are located. But uh, in general, uh, let's say some years ago, they were not so. Uh, Common because of the cost of the construction, and um, that is an important fact in 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 our country. Yeah, this is for again. Uh, my 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 observations from from just different earthquakes in different types of countries and all that was mostly the, probably a lot of times the the de development of the country with, where Chile is a lot more advanced than um, Ecuador and the economy is a lot more advanced. And and as uh, Gabby was saying, the cost of having alternative um, building. Uh, wall systems like um, light frame, light steel gauge, or, or anything like that is a lot more expensive. I, I do know that it happens in a lot of developing countries. Like if you use anything that's manufactured rather than that can be produced on site or in the city, like bricks and things like that, um, it 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 allows them to use a cheaper method like brick and fill rather than going with a shear wall. Um, there's another question on: Did any of you have a chance to look at? I'm sorry, no, excuse me. The earthquake again showed that the buildings with only frames were were damaged when not properly uh, detailed. When not, I'm sorry, when not proper detailing is done, our structural engineers in Ecuador now realize that the need of RC uh, structural walls. So let me let me let me phrase that again. The, this earthquake again showed that buildings with only frames will damage when not proper detailing is done. Our structural engineers in Ecuador have now realized that the need of using RC structural walls. Um, this, is anyone able to comment on that one on our team? Uh, I, I can probably talk a little bit. Um, 
I think it's not that just now uh, structural engineers in Ecuador realize that. Um, I think this question kind of goes along with the, with the last one. Um, if you go uh, to a different city, for example, to Quito, which has, uh, you will see all these um, middle, uh, medium high rise buildings with mostly all of them with uh, share walls. Uh, so I think it's a matter of age. You know, the, the buildings that, a lot of the buildings that uh, we go, we went over like the ones in Bahia um, or the hospitals or uh, even the ones in Puerto Viejo or Manta, they are probably, I don't know, like I would say, like the hospitals were at least from the 80s. So that's, we're talking about like 35 to 40 years old. Um, so I think it's 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 becoming more common. Um, plus, uh, if, if you look at the story of the, of the high of those buildings, those are uh, like in Bahia, that you can tell uh, the taller ones, they are probably I don't know, like 10 to 15 stories at most, and you still can be okay with the moment frame. Um, uh, so it's, I, I know I know it would be more reasonable, um, but if you go back like 35 years ago, and, and pro probably moment frame was that option. And uh, again, if if the design is correct, that should still perform well. Um, and it was also I guess. I guess the point on that, and uh, I will conclude with this, is that you have a 7.8 magnitude earthquake. Um, expected drifts are really high on, on, on moment frames. Um, so that kind of just explains what, what was happening. Boris, this is Art. Can I just add one real quick comment? Sure. Um, I don't know as to the why, but I can tell you that it, it, many years ago, it was a, a very strong predilection for the frame. Gabby and I uh, inspected uh, a building in Bahia where the elevator, instead of having structural walls around it, actually had a reinforced concrete frame made of corner columns and very short coupling beams on the high, on a, a eight to ten story high building. Uh, so the predilection for using frames was very strong back in the 60s or 70s when that building was designed and built. Great, thank you, Art. Um, Sissy, are you are you are you on the line right now? Yes. Yes. There's a question that I think you'd be best to answer. What was the predominant um, frequency estimate um, for the PGA in the closest city to the epicenter? Is that some? You you can hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, one second. Don't mean to put you on the spot. No, 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 no. Um, so, could you repeat the question? What was the what was the uh, predominant, predominant um, PGA, PGA um, the frequency estimate in the closest city to the epicenter, which I guess would be for Tanales. Okay, uh, so the, the the largest PGA was the 1.4 G. Um, so the predominant period, I assume that you are uh, the the question is about the predominant period of the response spectrum of this record. Is that yeah. correct? Okay. Yes, yeah, we have it in the presentation. It's on slide number eleven, but uh, I can talk about it. It looks like that the largest amplification uh, for the east-west uh, component that recorded the 1.4 G is um, on the order of 0.7 uh, seconds and we do have measurements of shear velocity um, in that record uh, which I don't, I don't think I have with me right now to confirm that this was the site period but it must be at, at that site period. There is also a very high spike at very short periods, like 0.1, but I believe that this seems to be from the record itself. Great, thank you. Um, I'm going to quickly uh, ask a different question was, one, did you find or visit any steel buildings and, um, or a steel building damaged during our visit? And w anyone else can uh, chime in, but the only one I can recall was the uh, 911 center, which wasn't was a steel construction, but it was more of a com composite. It w still had all the uh, masonry and concrete encasing the uh, steel members. Um, and actually, 
that building actually performed pretty well. There was, there was mostly just cosmetic damage. I don't know if anyone else wanted to comment on that question. Okay, and then um, I'm going to move on to another question. Um, how did combined mainstream construction perform? Seems like low-rise buildings of this construction did okay. Um, does anyone want to comment on that? I, I, we, most of the buildings we saw were, was reinforced concrete with masonry info. I think if there were um, confined masonry, it must be in the residential, but I, we didn't specifically look at those is, unless someone else on our team can. Yeah, this is Hector. I can comment on it. Uh, uh, hello? Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Go ahead. Uh, the confined masonry is uh, virtually not used in, in Ecuador. Not uh, for non-engineered buildings and not for, for, the, for, for the housing. Um, it's, it's a system that, um, well, I, I simply did not observe any, any example. The, the, the technique there is to build uh, columns which uh, are about the uh, square about the thickness of the of the wall, and then you build first the the columns. Uh, you might even put the roof uh, on on top, and then it's infilled with with brick. And um, the the system, uh, in my view, did not perform uh, very well. Great. Um, thank you. If anyone else has any questions, uh, please feel free to email EERI and uh, we will try to get the right person to uh, respond to it. Yeah. And thank you. And thank you for everyone joining us um, from everywhere you are located at. It's been um, a very educational trip. The team was was great. We, we're under such a huge time constraint and we're trying to see as much as possible and had to really work our logistics out and I think it was very successful. And again, thank you for all our team members and and gear and um, and the presentation, I'm sorry, I was giving a note, and the presentations will be available online and um, I think that will be posted on the EURI website. And again, thanks for everyone who's, uh, who's listening in. Thank you.